Good morning. It is 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. I want to say a very special welcome to our friends at Dealey, Montessori, and International Academy of Dallas ISD. Uh, teachers, if you're watching and you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. Sign up. We'd appreciate it. It's just for our attendance records. Uh, the program today will be characteristics of animals. <clears throat> During this virtual field trip, students will sort animals into groups based on physical characteristics, such as body covering, identify basic parts of animals. Mr. Monroe will do a program about amphibians. Ms. Fuller will tell you all about birds. Ms. Nash will cover reptiles, and Ms. Ramirez will present a program about mammals. During this program, you cannot verbally ask us a question, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC question, uh, space question space answer and send it in. I'll try to answer it during the program. If not, I will uh, send the answer to your teacher. I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Monroe was going to tell you all about amphibians. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be looking at a very special group of animals that we call amphibians. In fact, I'll say this, they are my favorite group of animals. Now, they are put in this group simply because they have a lot of similarities, characteristics that are all the same. You know, the animal kingdom is made up of two big groups, those that have backbones and those that don't have backbones. And I will tell you, amphibians belong to the group that have backbones. So we call those vertebrates. Any animal or organism that does have a backbone belongs to the group that we call vertebrates. Now, those that don't have backbones, we call those invertebrates. A perfect example of, of an invertebrate would be a worm. So they don't have skeletons inside of them, or so they don't have a backbone. So what is an amphibian? Well, again, it's an animal with a backbone but they have other characteristics. In fact, let me share this with you before we really get started. You know, I want you guys to try to remember some of the things that I show you because, and I tell you about, because later on your teacher just might ask you a few questions. Your teacher might even ask you, can you remember two characteristics that Mr. Monroe told you about that amphibians have? Your teacher might even ask, uh, What's the importance of water to an amphibian? So guys, listen, pay, pay close attention to what's going to be going on in the next few minutes. You know, amphibians are cold-blooded. That's one characteristic. That means that their body temperature inside their body, you know, it's going to be cool or cold or whatever the surrounding temperature or the environmental temperature is around them. For example, if an uh, uh, amphibian is in water and that water is cold, guess what? The inside of their body is going to be cold. That means they get their body heat from outside. Now, another thing that amphibians have makes them very special. They live two lives. The first part of their life or the first life, they live in water. Then they breathe air or breathe oxygen by using gills. They lay eggs, their eggs are laid in water. And as those eggs hatch, life truly begins for amphibians. Now, some of the well-known amphibians that are around us today are frogs and toads. You're probably not going to believe this, but right here in the state of Texas, there are 63 different kinds of amphibian. There are 42 different kinds of toads and frogs. And of course, the most common frog or toads that we see around the Environmental Ed Center, if we were walking around the pond today, you might see a bullfrog or you would hear one. 
Or you might see a leopard frog and that frog has spots, just like a leopard, I guess. Now, listen, the second part of an amphibian's life, they live on land. So, you know, they live in water, the first part of their life, the second part of their life, they live on land. Now, frogs and toads, you know, any time that we uh, try to determine whether something is alive, one of the characteristics of a living thing is that they grow, right? Well, the unique thing about amphibians, not only do they get bigger, but their body goes through different changes. As they get ready to make that change from living on land, I mean, living in water to land, their body goes through changes. Frogs and toads, they start out hatching from an egg. Now, those eggs are laid in water, just like I said, but when they hatch from those eggs, they become an organism or an animal that we call a tadpole. Here I have a tadpole in a beaker of water. This is a live tadpole. And this tadpole is going to be swimming around in this water. And you see that it has a tail that it uses to swim with. And you see that it is submerged underneath the water. So it is breathing oxygen because it needs oxygen to stay alive with body parts called gills. Now, after time passes, the body of the tadpole is going to go through some changes. We call that metamorphosis. This tadpole is a further along. It's a little older than the tadpole that I showed you. And it now has some legs, some back legs. Now, eventually front legs are going to appear on this tadpole. Let's see if I can get that a little closer so you guys can see that leg. Yeah, you can see them a little bit. Now, once the front legs come out, then the tail is going to eventually disappear. And then the tadpole becomes a frog. And we can see that this is the frog form of the tadpole. This is a very immature frog. He's got the web feet and he's got the little finger sticking out here. And if you notice, He's got now to keep, he's got to keep his head above water so that he can breathe because now he's breathing oxygen through his nose, okay? Instead of using gills. So going through those life cycle changes, that tadpole has now become an immature frog. And eventually what's going to happen is going to get big. And I have a perfect example of what that little frog is going to look like by the time he is an adult. This is an adult bullfrog. It started out just like a tadpole there. This is Hoppy the bullfrog. Now Hoppy the bullfrog is a full grown or a mature bullfrog. Now at this stage, he will spend a lot of his life around the edge of the pond, okay? He's gonna keep his skin wet for several reasons. First of all, the main reason is that Hoppy has, our bullfrogs have a three-chambered heart. And so their body, their lungs that are inside the body really doesn't process enough oxygen to keep Hoppy alive. So he has to get some of his oxygen from somewhere else. Guess where it has to come from? it comes from his skin. Because his skin is what we call permeable, it means it's got tiny little holes that gases can come through those little tiny holes. Gases in the form of oxygen come through those little tiny holes and that's where he gets some of the oxygen that is keeping him alive. Now, if his skin should dry out, guess what? It would not be good for Hoppy. He would probably die, guys. That would not be good. It would be like him suffocating, not being able to breathe. Now, something else about Hoppy. Now, in the water, he uses these feet to swim, right? Look at him, big old web feet. Boy, he's an excellent swimmer. And you know what else? It also gives him a very good platform to jump from. If I was to put Hoppy down, he would be able to jump six to eight feet across this floor here be very hard to catch him, right? 
because he's got muscular legs. Look at those legs, they're very strong. So, you know, amphibians usually are going to be yellow, brown, or green in their body color, kind of helps them blend in in their surroundings. We say that they're camouflaged a lot, okay? Favorite food of a bullfrog or most uh, amphibians are insects, and we ought to be glad that they eat a lot of insects. Oh, Hoppy here, he can almost eat his body weight in insects in one day. Because you know what? If we think about all the living things in the world today, there are more bugs and insects than any other living thing. They really outnumber us. And you know what? We ought to be glad that we've got animals like Hoppy and toads and newts that make up the amphibian group. We ought to be glad that we've got those because they keep that number down to a tolerable number where we can deal with it. Sometimes we don't think we can deal with it. But that's old Hoppy, okay? I'm gonna put him up. Now, there are two well-known members of the frog family that live around our center. The leopard frog, which has a lot of spots, won't get as big as old Hoppy, and then we have the bullfrog. And you know what, guys? They are an environmental indicator. You heard me tell you how they breathe oxygen. And you know, if the air is bad around the pond or the water's got a lot of pollution in it, do you think those frogs can live there? No. Well. The other well-known member of the amphibian group that we see a lot is toads. And I do have a toad to show you. Now, the little toads that we see around here, the spring toads and other smaller species of toads, they don't compare to this guy that I'm getting ready to get out. This is called a giant toad. Bear with me. He's trying to get out. Come here, toad. This is what we call a giant toad. And you can see that his skin is a little different. His body structure is a little different than, than Hoppy. His skin is real rough. Hoppy's skin was real smooth and slimy. Now this skin does not have to stay as wet as Hoppy. If we look at the body structure, toads have little legs and big bodies. So do you think this toad can hop as far as Hoppy can hop? I don't think so. I could probably catch this guy if I put him down on the floor because he wouldn't be able to hop very far. But guess what? They go through the same life cycle changes as a frog. They start out as an egg in the water, they hatch into a tadpole, and then that tadpole goes through the same changes that the bullfrog tadpole also went through. That's the toad. Now, water is very important to these animals because they are born where? In water. And water is also important to frogs because they have to keep their skin wet or moist. I want you guys to have a good day today. I'm gonna to turn it back over to Dr. Gorman and maybe if any of you have any questions, he'll be able to answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe and Hoppy. And we do have a question. Uh, it is, what is the largest amphibian in the world? Okay, the largest amphibians are the giant salamanders of China. They can grow more than five feet in length and weigh well over a hundred pounds. Now guys, get your teacher if you would, or he would, to show you how tall five feet is. And that's how long these big old salamanders are crawling around over there in China. I'm kind of glad we don't have any of them here. And now we're gonna let Miss Fuller Tell us all about birds. Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Fuller, and this is my lab assistant. Her name is Lauren Chicken. Lauren Chicken is a bird. Now, all, all birds have several things in common, one of which is their skin covering. Birds are covered in feathers. If you see an animal covered in feathers, you know it's a bird. I want to show you the flight feathers on her wing. Chickens don't really fly very far but they can fly, at least mine can. And here are her flight feathers, and it helps her fly by pushing against the air. Another thing uh, common to birds are their mouths. They have beaks or bills. She has a beak. I'm gonna put her up here close to the camera so you can see her sweet face. Do you look at her face? Do you see that beak? 
She uses that beak to capture bugs and worms, and she also eats um, seeds and things like that, corn, that, those sort of things. Another thing has to do with their feet. Now, look at her feet. She's got blue legs. She's an interesting chicken, but look at her toenails. They're very long. She uses those long toenails to dig in the dirt, to uh, scare up bugs, to dig for worms and other tasty things to eat. So um, those are some characteristics of birds. And another thing that she did this morning, she laid an egg. All birds are born from eggs and Lauren's no exception. She lays an egg every day. She's a real good chicken. I'm gonna put her down and show you some more feathers. Come on, Lauren. Yes, now here is another flight feather from a different kind of bird than um, Lauren. And you'll see it's real stiff. I can't even bend it, it's very hard. And these filaments are all hooked together. So when the bird flies, it pushes against the air with the feather. Now, another kind of feather is a contour feather. This kind of feather is smooth up against the body of the bird and helps the bird be aerodynamic. So it can slip through the airstream when it flies, a contour feather. Another kind of, this is my favorite, it's called a down feather. I'll show you these. None of the filaments are stuck together. They're all loose and fluffy and it traps air against the body of the bird and helps the bird be warm. And then finally, ooh, look at this, a peacock feather. How do you think the, the peacock uses this feather? It can't fly with it, it's too flimsy and it's too thin to be warm. So what does it do? This is in the tail of the ma male peacock and when he spreads his tail out, he's got all kinds of numbers of these things. It makes him look enormous. It can scare an animal away. And also with that design, it makes him look like he's covered in eyes. So it really is an exciting way for him to protect himself. It's quite impressive looking. And the second reason other than to uh, scare other animals away it actually attracts mates. The female peacock is called a pea hen and she likes these feathers. So that's another reason for the feathers. So we've seen four different kinds of feathers but five different uses of the feathers. I'm going to share my screen with you and we're gonna look at some of the other aspects of uh, or characteristics of birds. So let's look at this. Birds, physical characteristics of birds. Now, remember a few minutes ago, I showed you Lauren's feet. And I said, Lauren has those long toenails and those long toes so that she can scratch. We'll look at the feet on this mallard duck to the left. This is the daddy duck. He's got a green head. In bird world, the males are the fancy ones. He has webbed feet. Can you see how wide his feet are? This helps him swim. Now you can't see very much of the, the foot of the kestrel in the middle. This kestrel is a bird of prey. That means he captures other animals and eats them. Here's his claw right here. It's called a talon. I don't know if you'd see that real well. He uses that to grasp his prey when he eats them, when he catches them to eat. He's a carnivore. And then over here, We've got the tiny little feet of the Eastern Bluebird. He uses those feet to grasp a branch. Now, here's some essential questions to think about. How do feathers help birds? Well, we've already talked about that. Number two, how do birds stay warm? Well, I think we've touched on that as well. So let's look at these three birds. The bird on the left is a hummingbird. The bird in the middle is the state bird of Texas, the mockingbird, and the bird on the right is a redbird or cardinal. Now, I live in Oak Cliff and I live in a neighborhood called the Redbird Neighborhood. Do you think my neighborhood was named after the cardinal? I think you're right, I think it was. Okay, now here is a cardinal nest right outside my classroom door in a rose bush. It's very well camouflaged. I'm circling where it is. It's very difficult to see. The mother cardinal did a good job of hiding the nest so that her babies would be safe. 
Now here are some basic characteristics of birds. Birds are warm blooded. They can control the, the temperature of their body with their sophisticated brain. Number two, birds have feathers. I've showed you four different kinds of feathers. We talked about five different uses or functions of those feathers. Number three, birds have beaks or bills. The beak or the bill is uh, adapted to what they eat. Number four, birds lay eggs. All birds lay eggs and the babies come from the eggs. Number five, birds, birds are vertebrates. They have backbones. So look at the nest on the left. That, that's a robin nest and the baby robins are called nestlings when they hatch out and they're helpless for quite a few days before they can get big enough to fly away. In the middle are some down feathers. Over on the right at the top is an eagle. Look at his sharp curved beak. He uses that because he's a bird of prey. Look at the duck on the right. The duck has a flat bill. The duck eats primarily weeds and things like that that he gets out of the pond. And he needs that wide flat bill to let the water run out when he grabs it. Also look at his feet. He has webbed feet so he can swim. Birds that eat plants are called herbivore. Herb means plant, vore means to devour or to eat. So herbivores eat plants. The uh, purple finch on the left is eating a sunflower seed. Look at his beak. His beak is perfect for a seed eater. Look at the uh, hummingbird over on the right. Uh, the hummingbird is drinking nectar from a flower. Birds that eat meat or insects are called carnivores. Carne means meat, vor means eater. The kestrel on the left, smallest bird of prey in Texas, we have them here at the Environmental Center. Uh, he's a meat eater and the great, uh, great horned owl on the right as well. Birds that eat plants and meat are called omnivores. That would be like our mockingbird, the state bird of Texas, or the corvids. Uh, uh, at the top is a, raven, a crow and below him is a raven. The corvids are very, very intelligent birds. They can learn to talk. They can recognize people's faces. They can develop empathy. Uh, they grieve when someone close to them passes away. And they, being omnivores, they eat everything that they can get their hands on, including the chicks of other birds or even the eggs of other birds and uh, bugs and worms and carrion. That means like roadkill, dead things. And over on the right, we've got a turkey and a chicken and they will eat bugs, worms and seeds and corn. So there's a cardinal nest right there. I'm gonna let you see the, the daddy. The daddy is gonna feed the, no, there's the mother. Sorry about that. And there's the baby. And when there's the daddy, when, when they bring food, the, the daddy is the red one and the mama is the tan one. When they bring food, the babies open their mouth as big as they can and they try to stuff the food in there. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stop this. Okay, and here is a feather challenge for you. Ask an adult for a feather and look at it with a hand lens. What do you see? Can you draw the feather? Draw the feather and show it to your teacher. Okay, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Gorman. If you have any bird questions, he'll be glad to answer them. Thank you, have a delightful week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Uh, no little cardinals, they could open their mouth very wide. I saw the daddy cardinal had his head clean down inside the mouth one of them. Okay, uh, the question came in. Uh, what is the smallest bird in the world? As far as we know, because you know there's some birds probably still in the jungles down there that we haven't even identified yet, but as far as we know, the smallest bird in the world is a bee hummingbird, like a honeybee, but it's a bee hummingbird. They weigh two grams, which a uh, one gram is the weight of those little pink sweet and low packages that people use for sugar. That's one gram. So the weight of two of them would be what this little bee hummingbird weighs. And it is two and one fourth inches long. And this yellow piece of paper is two and one fourth inches. That is a very small bird. Now, Miss Nash 
is going to tell you about reptiles. Welcome to my classroom. Today we're talking about one of my favorite groups of animals, the reptiles. And we're going to talk about the characteristics of reptiles, distinct about their body and their behavior to let us know that they are indeed a reptile. So the first thing is something inside their body. And we have the same things inside our body. We have bones. You feel these bones? If you find your neck, feel those bones all the way down your back. Those bones are called the vertebra. And another name is a backbone. So this is a little part of a skeleton uh, of a little snake I found one time. You can see all those little vertebra, the bones that make up your backbone. Now, sometimes children come and they say, I don't think snakes have any bones. Look how they move. But of course, they actually have another little snake skeleton, a complete one this time, with the head, the body, and the tail. No leg bones, but they've got lots and lots of bones. And all those vertebra, or the backbone, is what have to move like they do, but they have lots of bones. So all reptiles have bones inside. And they are what we call vertebrates, these for vertebrates. Now, if we pick one up, they feel kind of cool. Pick a little turtle and see how he feels. And he feels, she feels cool. I feel warm because I'm a mammal. But my turtle here is cool. Her body temperature is the same temperature as the classroom. It's a little cooler in here. To get warm, my turtle would have to sit on a nice rock in the sun or in a sunny place or under a heat lamp in her cage to get warm. Their body temperature changes depending on where they are. So they're what, we, what we call it being cold, right? but they're not always cold. Sometimes they're cold and sometimes they're warm. That's what's happening inside, bones and blood that changes temperature. Now, on the outside, they have scales. All reptiles have scales. And you can see my little snake skin here. The, the snakes and lizards shed their skin. The snake in one piece, little eye scales there from the tip of the nose, all the way down to the tip of that tail. They just kind of peel it off like you peel off a sock. Now, I have a little friend here who's shedding his skin. But he's a lizard, so he just kind of sheds it in pieces. <laughs> it looks funny. He looks funny. Look, look at the feet. See the little piece of scale on the feet, okay? And then the head, it looks like he's got a little mask on or a hat of some kind. He said the scaly skin is dried up and ready to fall off, but he needs to rub it off, okay, to get it all off. We've got scaly skin. His is kind of bumpy, okay? He's a little gecko. And they come from a desert, so he's got that nice camouflage scale. Look at our turtle again. Turtles have a shell. In addition to having scaly skin, they all have a shell. So the turtles are reptiles that are kind of unique. They have a, a beak and a shell. Other reptiles have teeth and just skin. But all turtles have a shell, but they're just scales on the feet. This is a box turtle, a land turtle. You might see them out in the woods. Please don't take them home as a pet. Leave them there. They're wild animals. They don't want to be a pet. Really. Look at another turtle. This one comes from the pond. Let's see if he'll cooperate today. Sometimes she cooperates and sometimes not. But you can see the, the shell, and you can't see the scales because he's got his legs full in that shell. Not a very happy little turtle. He says, Now, what are you doing to me? Let me go. But trust me, he's got scales on his feet. You can see that beak. Okay, up there. I have a beak and a shell, but they're still reptiles. Now, most reptiles play eggs. There are a few snakes and even some lizards that have live birth, but mostly eggs. And they can lay their eggs on land, 
Remember the amphibians that Mr. Monroe showed you? They have to lay their eggs in the water, but not the reptiles. They can lay their eggs on land. And even those sea turtles that spend their entire life in the ocean, they have to come back to land to lay the eggs. The eggs have to be laid on land. And that sea turtle has to come up for a breath of air every so often because they, they have to they have lungs and they have to breathe air. I mean, everyone's favorite, favorite reptile, the snake. Come here, Red. This is Red. It's a beautiful snake. He's called a corn snake or rat snake. He's sticking his tongue out. He's smelling with that tongue. He's looking all around, moving around. And Bob, you may think, how can he have any bones? Remember, it's that skeleton, that long, long backbone that allows him to move around like that. So he's got lots of bones inside. And he, again, feels cool because his body is the same temperature as this classroom. Now, if, I look, if you look at their beautiful, shiny scales, you can see how they protect his body. And on the belly, on the bottom, he's got some different ones, and they kind of help him move. Okay. The scales protect the body, and they allow the snake to live in dry places. An amphibian would not move very happily. But because he's a reptile, he's just fine in a desert. Okay. So really amazing animals. Remember, don't ever pick up a wild animal. If you find it, just observe it, and then leave it alone. They're wild animals. So our animals here are our little pets, but we don't take any animals out of the wild. So I hope you enjoy meeting the reptiles and you can learn more about them. If you have any questions, Dr. Gordon, we're glad to answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash and Red. Wow, that's a beautiful snake. What an unusual coloration. Okay, uh, the question is, what is the largest reptile in the world today. Saltwater crocodiles are the largest crocodile species in the world and the largest living reptile in the world. The largest one was 22 feet long. Now that's a big crocodile. And now Miss Ramirez is going to do a theatrical program about mammals. Hello, my name is uh, Miss Ramirez and we're going to be learning about those special furry animals. So before we get started, I have a little poem for you guys. I'm going to say a sentence and act it out, and then you guys will repeat it after me. So the first thing we're going to do, you're going to take your hand, you're going to touch the back of your neck, feel that hard bone. That bone goes from your neck all the way down the middle of your back. That's called your vertebrate. Can you guys say that word? Vertebrate. It's just your backbone. So again, take your hand, touch your backbone or vertebrate, and we're going to say, I'm a little vertebrate. I'm a little vertebrate. Now touch your hair and go with fur or hair. With fur or hair. Now you're going to rock your arms and say, my mother gave me milk. My mother gave me milk. Now you're going to make a heart with your hands and say, and raised me with care. And raised me with care. Who am I? Who am I? So now I'm going to say it one more time all together and think about which one of these animals do you think we just described? So here we go. I'm a little vertebrate with fur or hair. My mother gave me milk and raised me with care. Who am I? Do you think it is a beetle, a bird, a turtle, or a dog. So which one do you think uh, we just described? Hopefully you guys said the dog. Uh, so the dog is what we call a mammal. And mammals have hair or fur. They have a vertebrate or backbone. They get milk from their mothers and their mothers usually do a pretty good job of taking care of them. So now I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Oh, actually, I have a mammal to show you guys. Um, so it's actually one of my favorite mammals, and it is a bunny or a rabbit. It might take me a little bit to take my rabbit out. So while you guys are waiting to meet my rabbit, if you can show me two bunny ears, you can stand. 
push your chair in and you're gonna do five bunny hops while I go and take our bunny out. So be working on your five bunny hops and I'll be right back with that bunny. So hopefully you guys are counting to five as you're doing your bunny hop. And here is my bunny. So now you guys can go ahead and take a seat so you can get ready to meet my bunny. Uh, so this bunny is Mochi. And we know that Mochi is a rabbit. Can you guys say hi, Mochi? So we know Mochi is a mammal because if you were to touch her, her body is covered with soft fur. Also, look at her nose. Look how it's moving or twitching. She is smelling. Look at those big eyes and her really long ears to help her listen. So again, we know that she's a mammal because her body is covered with hair. Uh, she also has a long backbone. When she was a baby, she drank milk from her mother and her mom probably did a really good job of taking care of her because of course she's still here right now. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and put Mochi, our bunny friend, uh, down and she's gonna go play around on the floor. And now I'm gonna share my screen with you guys and we'll take a look at some other mammals. So let me get that screen share started. I do have a couple of questions for you guys. So while you guys are uh, listening to the presentation, uh, be on the lookout for these answers. So the first question is, you should be able to tell your teacher at least two characteristics of a mammal. So what are some things that make a mammal a mammal? Uh, the second is you should be able to name two examples of mammals. And hopefully you guys can see some of those uh, really cute furry mammals in the slide. So we know that mammals have hair or fur. So remember, touch the top of your head, you guys have hair on your bodies. Uh, also, mammals are warm blooded. So if you take your hand and feel your neck, uh, you typically feel rather warm. Uh, so mammals are warm blooded and that just means their body temperature stays for the most part about the same unless you're sick. Um, also mammals uh, give live birth. So for example, you guys and our puppy from the, from the picture earlier, uh, they were not hatched out of an egg. We were born live. Now there are two exceptions. So there's only two mammals in the entire world that actually lay eggs. And those two mammals are the echidna, the spiky animal here, and the platypus, this little animal here. So those are the only two mammals that actually lay eggs. All the other animals, all the other mammals um, have live births. So you can see the cute little platypus hatching out of the egg. Again, those are the only two exceptions to the rule. And then, uh, of course, we know that mammals have lungs. So if you take a big breath in, breathe out. You guys are breathing with your lungs. And that's important because mammals can live in the water or on land. But either way, we all have lungs. So those are some characteristics of mammals. Now I'm gonna show you guys some mammals at the Environmental Center. These are some mammals at our farm. So we have CV, the longhorn. He was the white animal with those big horns. And then we have Chocolate, who's that black cow. Um, so these are mammals and we know that because their body is covered with fur or hair. And you can see them sticking their uh, noses and tongues at my camera. They thought I had food for them, but unfortunately I didn't bring them any. Uh, but that's okay because they have lots of grass that they can chew and munch on. Hopefully uh, when school starts back again, you guys will be able to come and visit us and you will be able to pet and feed uh, CV and chocolate. Those are two of my favorite cattle that we have out there because they're super friendly and nice and they always wanna come up to you to give you guys um, some little cow kisses. Uh, so there's CV again with his long wet tongue and his nose. Here is Winnie, a pot belly piggy. I remember when she first came to us, she was a tiny, cute little pig. And now she's that huge uh, pig that you guys see in the video. This next one is gonna be Jabez the goat. And he is trying to eat a pecan leaf. Uh, so he loves those yummy green leaves. And then we also have Midnight, the sheep. She's the brown uh, mammal in the back. And of course we know 
that we can use the hair or the fur of sheep for wool. Now she's not really the, we don't really get a uh, nice wool from that breed of sheep, uh, but there are other sheep that we can get some better wool from. And of course you can see Jabez is not being a nice friend to Midnight. He was over there headbutting her. Uh, but those are some furry mammals that we have at the environmental center here in our barn. Uh, the next thing I have for you guys is a challenge. It's a mammal scavenger hunt. See if you can find three examples of mammals. So think about what mammals can you find inside, outside, in a book, in a movie, maybe on TV, or maybe represented as toys that you guys might have at home or at school. And for an example, uh, one of my favorite movies when I was a kid was Pocahontas. And this is one of my favorite characters from that movie. His name was Miko and he is a raccoon. But we know that raccoons are mammals because they're covered in fur. So think about what are some examples of mammals that you guys can find at home or at school. And again, earlier we learned that mammals can also live in the water. So here's some example of those mammals that are aquatic or live in the water. So I'm gonna stop my screen share really quick and I have a couple of poems for you guys. Uh, the first one, since you guys met my rabbit Mochi, it's a little poem about the rabbit. So if you can show me two bunny ears like this and you guys can follow along with me and it's called, I saw a little rabbit. So here it goes. I saw a little rabbit go hop, hop, hop. So I saw a little rabbit go hop, hop, hop. I saw her little ears go flop, flop, flop. I saw her little ears go flop, flop, flop. I saw her little eyes go blink, blink, blink. I saw her little eyes go blink, blink, blink. And then the last one, I saw her little nose go twink, twink, twink. So hopefully you guys were able to see Mochi. Did you see her ears flop or did you see her nose or her eyes move or blink? Um, so that was for a rabbit. And my last little poem is a quick review of those characteristics of a mammal. So if you would like, feel free to stand as we act this last poem out. And it's just gonna review with you guys the characteristics of a mammal. So here we go. You guys are gonna repeat after me. We are the mammals. We are the mammals. How can you tell we're one? How can you tell we're one? We've got nice warm blood. We've got nice warm blood and a big strong skeleton and a big strong skeleton. Some live in water, some live in water, but we all breathe air, but we all breathe air. And our four-legged bodies are covered with hair. And our four-legged bodies are covered with hair. Our babies are special. Our babies are special because it's mama's milk they drink. Because it's mama's milk they drink. Are you a mammal? What do you think? So think about that question. Hopefully you guys said, yes, we are a mammal. Again, think about it. We have hair on our bodies. We have that backbone or vertebrate. And our parents do a good job of taking care of us. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today on mammals. We're going to give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. That's a hard act to follow. Okay, sticking with the program today, what is the largest mammal in the world? The Antarctic blue whale is the biggest animal on the planet, weighing up to 400,000 pounds. That's about the weight of 33 grown elephants and reaching up to 98 feet in length. That's a big critter. Okay, now we're going to share the screen. During this virtual field trip, students sorted animals into groups based on physical characteristics, such as body covering, identified basic parts of animals. Mr. Monroe, discussed amphibians. Ms. Fuller did a program about birds. Ms. Nash introduced you to several different reptiles and Ms. Ramirez did a theatrical program about mammals. Thank you teachers.
How did we do? If you would, go to www.towny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a very short form and send it back to us. We would appreciate it. Thank you. You have a great day. And more importantly, you have a great life.